joining us online. Pastor Owen, would you open in prayer for us today? Either way, up here. Okay. Father, we thank you now for this meeting that we can come into your house, which you have designated as a house of prayer. And we might gather our thoughts and um, as we reflect upon those burdens that you have given to us, that we might come and pray, we might even worship in prayer, that we might express um, our faith as we pray. Lord, as we, um, as we come into this house, we do pray you would give us that sense that you are here, that you might minister thy word to us initially, and then as we pray, Lord, be amongst us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, it's greatly needful for us to cry to God and seek the Lord in prayer. And we want to have a, a brief encouragement from God's word on the subject of prayer and revival. This will not be the only time we will look at this theme because revival is inherently woven through the matter of prayer, especially corporate prayer. So I believe we'll be touching on this theme regularly. But I think we all agree that we need revival. Nothing short of a heaven-sent revival. Because the world is collapsing before our very eyes. There are tangible, biblical reasons why the church, not only our church, but all churches, need to gather together to cry to God fervently as we've never done before. The level of sin and wickedness that per pervades the world seems to rival the days of Noah before the flood. Iniquity is saturating the world. And the Bible says that the righteous groan in such circumstances. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man, Luke 17, 26. Moving forward as iniquity increases, it is not going to be easy for Christians apart from the grace of God. In just 60 years, the corruption of the earth has reached immense proportions. As the prophet Daniel already indicated in 221 that mm. God changes the times and the seasons. We read in Matthew 24, 12, and because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold, but he who endures to the end will be saved. I don't have to recount reason after reason, for you and I to gather together and cry to the Lord for revival, for mercy, for the salvation of souls that have long been held captive in sin and in slavery to sin. Your own hearts and your own souls and your own discernment has been witnessing of these things. So I invite you to join us at Christ Bible Church. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Join us here between now and when the Lord comes, whenever that would be, or when you are taken by him as a believer, to seek his face until he pours out his spirit upon us. We have at a local church a ministry of self-reformation. Every church is responsible to guard our hearts and to reform our ways when they decline morally and spiritually. But as we get closer to the end of the world, as we are responsible to watch out for our souls, on the one hand, we read in Scripture that the church will experience unprecedented persecution unlike very few time periods in history. Daniel 12, verse 7, as, as you know, Daniel is full of prophecy, says, And when the power of the holy people has been completely shattered, 
all these things shall be finished. In other words, they're on their way, they're close. But it is only when the power of the church, the holy people, have been completely shattered. Yes, God will give his own people and the institution of the church over to persecution on a level that is unthinkable for the true believer. We read in Revelation 13, 7, it was granted to him, that is the Antichrist, to make war with the saints and to overcome them. It's not a pretty picture for the church. Thank God that our salvation is solid and assured and that no one will snatch his elect out of the Father's hand. But as we get closer to the end, which I believe we are in the end times, the level of pressure and persecution and suffering against the saints of Christ will increase dramatically. Again, back in Daniel we read in 725, he shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and law. Then the saints shall be given into his uh, hand for a time and times and half a time. The pompous speaker here is, again, the Antichrist who will persecute the saints and will attempt to completely change times and law, which we, we are seeing before, in, in, uh, before our very eyes. The United States of America in the last 60 years has gone through a revolutionary change in terms of the moral decay and the once time-honored institutions that were upheld for over 200 years are now being disintegrated in a rapid way. And that should cause our hearts to be grieved. That should cause us to be concerned. That should drive us to prayer. Men's hearts failing them for fear of the things that are coming on the earth. Daniel 8.24 says, He shall destroy the mighty and also the holy people. The holy people will be destroyed. And so the church needs to be prepared for the coming persecution against Christians and churches. Are we prepared? It begins with the heart. Are we stirred up enough to commit ourselves to prayer? The apostasy of the church also, we are told, is so vast, and we can see it as well, and so deep that it should cause the church to groan and to cry over her sins. That is the progenitor, the beginning of every revival. When the saints come together, even a handful of them, and begin to travail and mourn, before the throne of grace, even though the 99%, the vast majority of the church is caught up in the world. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 5, 1 and 2 to the carnal Corinthians, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and such sexual immoral immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles that a man should, should lie with his father's wife and you, have, you are puffed up and have not rather mourned. He rebukes the church for sitting idly by, idly by, watching the worst kind of sin occurring in their presence. Can we sit back and watch passively while the world and the church is spiraling down the drain morally without a, even a handful of us crying to God? Again, in 2 Corinthians 12, 21, he says, My God will humble me among you, and I shall mourn for many who have sinned before and have not repented of the uncleanness, fornication, and lewdness which they have practiced. Paul is telling the Corinthians, You won't mourn for this sin. You won't cry as a corporate body in a prayer meeting. He says, My God, with prophetic insight, will humble me among you, if that's all it takes, just me, and I'll mourn for many who have sinned. What about the 
masses filling our professing churches who are living double lives. Who is mourning for them? Who is weeping for them and their souls? May God give us a spirit of grace and supplication, a special spirit to cry to him and lament over the sins of the church. The world has flooded into the church and has taken it over in so many ways. Ezekiel 9.4, God tells the angel, go through the midst of the city of Jerusalem, through the midst of Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and cry over all the abominations that are done within it. Not only are these this small group of true believers separating themselves like Lot and his family in Sodom from the abominations that are taking place in the city but there's another activity they engage in they're sighing and crying for the abominations of the people and we must do this as well because this will catch up to us and we cannot be found unprepared Oh, that we might be found ready before him as, at his coming. Jeremiah 13, 15. Hear and give ear. Do not be proud, for the Lord has spoken. Give glory to the Lord God before he causes darkness. The United States of America is representative of many countries of the world have not been completely cast away with, with total destruction like Sodom and Gomorrah. Economically, morally, and in many other ways, the falling away is happening. We're suffering the effects of it in our society, in our culture, in our economics, inflation, the redefinition of who a woman is, and the mutedness of our politicians to even chime in and attempt to define what a woman is and the perverted practices and the redefinition of what God has created on so many levels has stirred God up. And so he sent this tsunami of judgment. We're beginning to experience the little trickling effects of that tsunami, but we could see the major part of that tsunami coming a mile or two down the road. If a tsunami is preceded by a light rain, we're experiencing the light rain of judgment, but we can see the massive tsunami coming on the horizon. And God tells Jeremiah, tell them, don't be proud. Give glory to the Lord your God before he causes the darkness, before the wave actually hits and before your feet stumble on the dark mountains and while you are looking for light, he turns it into the shadow of death and makes it dense darkness. But if you will not hear it, Jeremiah says to the people, my soul will weep in secret for your pride. My eyes will weep bitterly and run down with tears because the Lord's flock has been taken captive. The Lord's flock has been taken captive. And just like the Apostle Paul, if nobody else in the church will weep for the sins of the Corinthians, Paul will, and God put it on his heart to do it. Jeremiah basically says the same thing. If, if you brethren or you Jews are not going to hear, he says, my eyes will weep bitterly and run down with tears. Why? Just like in Paul's case, the Lord's flock has been taken captive. The Lord's flock in many ways, not all, thank God, but most, has been blinded, has been shackled, has been hindered. There has been poured out upon most churches a spirit of leanness, deception, and deprivation when it comes to having, having a heart for God any longer. The ability to pray. There is such a stronghold of spiritual superficiality that muzzles the mouths and the spirits of those who are once gifted and 
whose hearts were full of marrow of the things of God. And so I, I appeal to you, based on Ecclesiastes 7, 2 and many other texts, that it is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. False joy, false happiness, when one's life is disobedient and shallow and double-minded, is not true mourning. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. That's seven, four. Again, in three, one, and four. To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. This is a time to weep and to laugh. I mean, and to mourn, rather. To weep and to mourn. Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now, don't take me wrong. That's not all there is to the Christian life. That's a small part of it. But the shoe has dropped. God has given his saints who hear what the Spirit is saying, who have spiritual ears, ears and discernment into such matters as I'm speaking about, to be moved with the fear of God and to understand that this is a time for mourning. The church will always be in a state of self-reformation, even if we were in a revival. But Jesus told the church in Ephesus in Revelation 2, 4, Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, where you have fallen. Go back to the point where you have departed from that place of repentance and do the first works. Repent, not for salvation, but repent of the sins that have controlled so much of church life and individual lives, or else God is going to remove the lampstand. He says, let us search out and examine our ways in Lamentations 3, 40. Let us search out and examine our ways. We ought to cry during the prayer meeting, God, search us and try us and see if there's any wicked way in us. We should pray that sincerely. We should pray it fervently. We should pray it with the fullness of our hearts, not paying lip service to some spiritual nicety we read about in the Bible, but really mean it with all of our hearts and pray about it week after week in the prayer meeting. Join together in oneness and unison with the people of God until God fulfills his promise to pour out a spirit of supplication upon his people, to grant us a spirit, a spirit of repentance where floods will be poured upon the dry grounds of our hearts and leanness will be replaced with the fatness of grace of the Spirit, that we might lay hold of God and not let Him go until He blesses us, because we're called to guard our spiritual lives. Timothy, we learn in 2 Timothy 3, but this know that in the last days perilous times will come, having a form of godliness, but denying its power from such people turn away. We've got to turn away from lukewarmness, from worldliness, from mediocrity. We've got to repent of spiritual backslidings. We've got to break up the fallow ground of our heart, not judge others, not look at others. Our spirits are grieved by what other professing churches are doing and not doing. But as for us, judgment must begin at the house of God. We must give ourselves over to seeking God with all of our heart. The Bible teaches that pastors are responsible to warn of the danger coming if we do, do not do such things. And protect the church. From what, Joe? From apostasy that have submerged the majority of churches. I know I speak for Pastor Owen and myself. We do not want such apostasy to immerse Christ's Bible church. God told Ezekiel in 33, 7, So you, son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore you shall hear a word from my mouth and warn them from me. There are countless verses which call church leaders in any given generation 
to be that watchman on the wall, to call the church back to her first love, to exhort, admonish, remind, instruct, stir up the brethren to, with a spirit of worship, supplication, and repentance to return to our first love. Mm -hmm. God says, him we preach in Colossians 1.28, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. A lukewarm professing Christian cannot be presented perfect in Christ Jesus. If such a professor leaves off and spins their wheels in neutral, spiritually speaking, pastors are called to warn, to teach, to exhort, so that, as we read at the outset, we can endure to the end. Obey those who have the rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give an account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. So the revival of the church is needed more today than ever before. One of the greatest promises that our brother Carney likes to quote all the time, 2 Chronicles 7.14, If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. Such a promise rolls over into the New Testament in principle mm -hmm. and applies to us. A.T. Pearson uh, said, There has never been a spiritual awakening in any country or locality that did not begin in united prayer. Hudson Taylor said, The power of prayer has never been tried to its full capacity in any church. If we want to see mighty wonders of divine and power wrought in the place of weakness, failure, and disappointment, let the whole church answer God's standing challenge. Call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou know not. Every converted sinner, J.B. Johnston says, is a soul revived to prayer. Every one of us is a soul converted to be revived to prayer. Every saint restored from backsliding is a soul returned to the life and power of prayer. Every congregation enjoying an outpouring of the Spirit is a congregation revived and alive to the prayer meeting. What are we going to say to God on our deathbed? What is Owen and I going to say to God as those who must give an account of our ministry if we don't fulfill our spiritual ministry? If we do not remind the church and call the church to pray. Mm. Forget about what the world is doing, current events. But do we have a burden for the spiritual life and vitality of the church? Where is your heart in this matter about this call to prayer? Is it indifferent? Is it dead? Is it cold? What's it going to take to get through? Well, we all have to start somewhere. But what are you doing about it? Do you need to revisit your commitment to the prayer meeting? Do you need to repent of unfaithfulness and ask God for a fresh vision for the prayer meeting? Is a revival of Christ's Bible Church, is a revival of the Spirit a priority in both your individual prayers and in your prayers for the church? Let us not grow weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. We have his promise. If anyone sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Mm -hmm. Christ is there for us as our high priest to restore, cleanse, and reestablish us as a praying church, a church led by the Spirit, filled with the Spirit, anointed by the Spirit, 
being equal to every spiritual responsibility that God calls us to instead of hanging our heads low and just mouthing words. We need the Spirit to give life to our words, to give life to our worship, to breathe love into our adoration to God. Without the Spirit of God, we are just an engine in neutral that will run out of gas eventually. I, I plead with you, my brothers, my sisters, please, please come and join heart to heart with the people of God. If you, if you are <clears throat> online today, we encourage you, if you are able to come in person, that's the ideal way to do it because there's something special about the presence of God when the saints are assembled together. But we thank you nevertheless for joining with us. And I'm glad to see that we've tripled the attendance of the prayer meeting in a couple of weeks. Not we, but the Lord has laid it on the heart of some to make it their business to pray. And I thank God for that. Remember, if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything in heaven, it shall be, do, be done. If, um, and he says, if two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. I'm going to ask uh, Pastor Owen to come and open the time of prayer. Uh, and then any brother who wants to stand up where you're at, speak up loud enough and pray. Let's begin this journey together. Pastor Owen.